Welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. Um, it happens to be Wednesday, November 3rd. This is live stream. So for those of you that are listening to the audio version after the fact, we do live stream all of our Boca Podcast episodes. I know I keep saying this, but I want to get more people involved. The, the number of listeners that we have at the Boca Podcast is kind of staggering at times. And I want to get more of you over here on the live stream. We are at youtube.com slash Boca Podcast. We're live streaming there now. And then we are also at... Uh, facebook.com slash Boca podcast, of course, B-O-K-E-H podcast. And you can watch the live stream there. You can comment, you can ask questions. The topic we're going to be getting into today is actually quite fascinating. Uh, I'm, I'm already kind of nerding out a little bit, and I'm going to introduce our brand new guest to bring that topic here in just a little bit. But it's a really op awesome opportunity to ask questions about the topic that myself and my guests are discussing. So please come join our conversation, make it a group conversation and uh, add to that conversation. We'd love to have you. And then for those of you that are live streaming, do just that. Engage, ask questions, comment, send us funny emojis, hang out with us. And uh, we'd love to make this a group conversation here on the podcast today. Housekeeping note of sorts, uh, as I promised I would do before every single podcast episode, I made a, a small donation to Charity Water before we got started today. You see the receipt on the screen. And uh, I do that again, just as a, a kind reminder to everybody to look for opportunities to give back. Even a little bit of money can go a long ways. And whether that's doing something in your local community or with a national or international organization, there's opportunity to give back. So look for those opportunities. Let's make a difference together. All right. I want to introduce our brand new guest for today. Uh, my new friend and new guest, <laughs> Fuse Rice, is here with me, or Fusa Rice. Uh, Fusa, you said everybody calls you or people know you as Fuse, right? How did you get the nickname? Correct. Actually, I was in high school. Um, okay. I went to high school in East Brunswick, New Jersey, and okay. there were a group of Egyptian friends, and they were the first ones to call me Fuse. And then once I launched my business and I started getting out there, it was kind of easier to say Fuse than Fusa because whenever anyone reads my e my name, they can't. They have no idea how to pronounce it. I've gotten everything <laughs> from fuchsia yeah. to, you know, fuesa. So I'm like, just call me Fuse. And then the whole get found with Fuse kind of made sense. Ah, okay, okay. And we're gonna get to that here in just a second, talking about your brand. Yes. Yeah, it's funny you say that about fuchsia. Somehow in preparing content and social media for, for our episode this week, we inserted an I at some point in your name. And so we posted something with Fusia and then, and then Jill was like, oh shoot, like that's, yeah, that's not right. <laughs> and, and so we had, to, I think we had to take one or two things down, but anyway, I think we've got it right now. So F E U Z A yes. Fuse Correct. or just Fuse uh, to keep fuse. it simple for everybody. Yeah. And um, you, we are going to get into not just simply SEO. SEO is a topic that, you know, we hear kind of thrown all around our photography yes. industry, but we're going to get into some of the differences, some of the changes in the mm -hmm. world of SEO as it relates to running a photography business um, as kind of our primary focus a little bit later. So we'll get to that. Everybody stick around. Um, I just want everybody to also have the opportunity to get to know you though, Fuse, myself included, by the way. Yeah. Uh, because we've only even had brief conversation in person. So let's start with your brand position. And this is something we talk about quite a bit on the podcast. In about 15 seconds, can you sum up what your business's brand position is? What makes you different from those in your marketplace? Sure. So my position is I believe anyone can get leads from Google organically and that you do not need to be this technical expert. And I believe actually anyone can do this on their own. So to me, it's all it's really about practical SEO things um, that gets us what we need, which is leads while we sleep is, is what I like to say. Um, so it does go against some of the bigger, more techie experts out there. I like to think to keep things really simple and practical. I love that. I, I, the accessibility piece is, is incredible. And I think it, you know, we talk about creating a brand position, you have to solve a problem for someone, mm -hmm. right? And ideally it's yeah. a specific problem that resonates with a, a target segment of people. Mm -hmm. I know that's a little technical and maybe a little robotic, but that's just the reality of how marketing works. Yeah. And so you've done that, you've, you've realized, okay, SEO to a lot of people, probably even most people, photography business owners is technically overwhelming. And so yes, I need to be able to bring this topic to photographers in a way that's easy to consume. It makes it accessible. And I think that's right. really cool. I'm actually going to bring up your website here real quick. Oh, thank you. Get, yeah, absolutely. Get found with Fuse, F-U-S-E. -E. F -U -S -E. F -U -S -E. Yeah. 
at getfoundwithfuse.com for everybody listening in and watching. And there on the homepage, above the fold, get found, be visible, and make organic sales. And I think this is the best presentation of your, your brand position in the subtext. I help experienced photographers and creative entrepreneurs transform their business by finally getting visible. And uh, I mean, that just kind of says it all. And I think it's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, and you know, and it, it, it goes a little bit beyond SEO as well. SEO is just a means, mm. but it's, it's, you know, really like, how can my brand be seen online? How can my brand be visible? How can, and then the second piece is, how can my brand be credible in the eyes of Google? Because Google is the biggest search engine in the world. Mm -hmm. And there is no, I always say this, you know, there is no overnight success with Google. Um, and we're in this for the long haul, right? If we're business owners and we want to be in business for a long time, we want that long-term relationship with Google. We want Google to be able to trust our website. So that's where the credibility piece comes in. And then it's the organic sales where we can get leads to our website without paying for ads, which is a different type of digital marketing. I, I was saying this to you before we got started, but I can already tell you're a teacher. The way that you yes. <laughs> present princ principles, ideas in such an organized fashion that's easy to understand. Uh, I'm, you're already getting me excited about this conversation. Let's, let's keep going because we have a lot to talk about. Yes. Another kind of 15 second answer, if you will. Tell me from your, your experience as a photographer and running this SEO company, what would you say is the most princi important principle in delivering a great customer experience? So for me, I think it's really aligning um, your expertise and your leadership with the customer's desires and really listening to the customer um, and over delivering, right? Not over, um, what is it? Over, you know, under promise and over deliver. So when it, sometimes with clients, um, we also have to showcase our expertise because we do know better for certain things. Um, and it's about guiding them. It's about taking them in that journey and not just say, Hey, you should do this, but say, Hey, you should do this because of this, but really listening to your clients. Like clients want to be listened to and understood. They do, but I love the simplicity that that idea of pairing your expertise with yes. their need. And again, that that, yes. that brings us to a great brand position statement that enables us to create a great brand position statement and ultimately a business model. Brilliant, brilliant summation there. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, I, I was just having this conversation with Jill who produces our show. We're, we're trying to we've been calling these rapid fire questions. And then it's funny because like the first four or five questions that are supposed to be rapid fire questions, ultimately they become take, longer. <laughs> they take like a half an hour of the show. So yeah, I'm trying to do a better job of this for everybody who, who listens regularly. I, I'm, I'm going to keep going though. Fuse, you're, you're setting a yes. standard for us. Um, so talk to me a little bit about time management, kind of shifting gears here. What is the biggest idea or principle that drives your ability to manage time, to find balance between personal and professional life? Yeah, that's a big one. And that's been a struggle. I've been an entrepreneur for 13 years. I was a wedding photographer for nine years. And for me, it definitely has to do with delegating and learning to let go and learning to really focus on your strengths and what you do best mm -hmm. and outsourcing. And also in the last year of the pandemic, as my business has grown, it's really I realized that I cannot grow without a team. There's no way I can scale my business without a team. And of course, systems systems are going to be really important. And also, I always need accountability because I am a workaholic, to be honest. Um, so I need accountability from my family. So recently yeah. I was on vacation in Europe for two weeks and it was hard for me to be quite frank just because I had booked a, a huge client right before and right after the photo cookout, I had booked three VIP days and then here I am off to Europe. So I felt, you know, that guilt like, oh my God, my business. So, you know, I had to really kind of let go and, and, and trust the team members to take care of things. But it takes a while. It took me a while to, to, to get at that point. But you talked about the significance of delegation and outsourcing, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful segue to my next question, which is what do you think is the, the most important principle behind a good experience in that regard? I'll add the caveat, which is that most photographers, their apprehension, at least when it comes to outsourcing editing, but I'm sure other areas as well, cost and then yeah. get, giving up control. Those are the two biggest yeah. concerns. How would you address either one of those? I think it's really more about giving up control. I think we, okay. we sometimes use the cost as an excuse, to be mm. honest. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, in these other excuses, but I think it's giving up the control and, and believing that so someone can not do it better. But I think also we are in this transition from where we're moving from the hustle kind of mentality into a like, you know what? 
self-care mental health is way more imp important than the hustle mentality because with the hustle mentality i feel like oh you have to do all the things you have to work 16 hour days in your business which is really not healthy at all mm -hmm. right so i think it's letting go and you know for me i always believe that done is better than perfect so letting go and delegating for me is not is not um so so challenging um but i did have issues where i had to work on my money mindset right about those costs and i think you really have to frame it this way it's an investment is this an investment for my business or is it a cost editing outsource editing is an investment that's going to save you so much time and that's actually going to make you excited about what you do best which is probably shooting and having that client communication or it might be you love marketing you know like i do um but it's really have to see okay if i this cost is an investment and i'm going to see a return on my investment so everything i look at as far as cost for my business even for myself even when shopping for clothes to be honest sometimes mm -hmm. i'm like do i really need this yeah. well you know i invest in my own professional photo shoots for my marketing launches i mm -hmm. hire you know photographers and it's an investment the outfits are investment the the photographer and the photos are an investment because i know then my feed looks way more professional and you you know I'm, I'm targeting photographers and i have professional photos so if you put on the hat of this is an investment um i think that's helpful one challenge is finding the right person you know finding the right editing company or you know finding the right whatever it is that you're looking for and sometimes that takes tweaking and testing but you need to keep on going until you really find the perfect fit or the best fit i should say there you go. <laughs> the best, but that's it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I, I've already alluded to the fact that you are a, a teacher, a, a quite a good one at that. Um, this would seem to suggest that you've spent a lot of time learning as well. And I'm sure from experience, but are there oh, yeah. particular books, self-help books or business books that you would recommend to our listeners? Sure. I love this question. So for me, three years ago, I started doing this a lot of inner work. Um, and I started listening to a podcast in Path Theory and I discovered Dr. Joe Dispenza and his teachings. And I just loved it because it really helped. I've struggled with anxiety and depression and it really has helped me understand how to change negative mindsets and how not to live in the past and really to change because, you know, we're here to evolve, right? We're here to become better and better. And I had a hard time accepting that. I thought like, what was wrong with me that I need to change so much? But that's a wrong way of looking at it. So Dr. Joe Dispenza, I really like listening to his teachings. I also recently just did the audiobook of We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. And as a woman entrepreneur and mom, I think it's a phenomenal book. Like, I'm not like, um, not everything I, I'm going to say, I don't agree with every aspect, but it just was really eye opening about like the woman's role in society and at the house and how we're expected to do so much. And she talks a lot about outsourcing. Actually, she talks about like investing in a house cleaner, for example, while you could go do other things or, or, or start by hiring a personal assistant that could come over and do a few things. So I think that was really great. Um, and Jen Sincero's You're Badass at Making Money was a really great book. I didn't think it would be as great as her first book, but I really like that book as well. OK, so we've got a number of options here. I'm going to actually jump over <laughs> to Amazon here for anybody who's listening and or watching for yes. that matter. Um, we've got You're a Badass at Making Money. And this is one from Jen Sincero that has been brought up a number of times in the podcast. Seems like a really popular one. And mm -hmm. so we'll make sure this goes in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. Uh, yeah. The subtext is A Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth, and Gaining Economic Power. And then Dr. Joe Dispenza, I, I have the book Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. I haven't read it yet. It, the, the, just mm -hmm. the concept, the principle behind it, how to lose your mind and create a new one sounds fascinating to me. Have you read that one? I haven't read it. I do a lot of audio things. He also okay. has a course on Gaia that yeah. I've been interested to take. I've only really listened to a lot of, because he does like over an hour long podcast interviews. And I'm just fascinated by, like he really breaks it down. It's not just, you know, think positive and things will happen. Um, but it's really about like, you know, how, how would it feel to be that person you strive mm. to be? What are the feelings associated with that? What would an ideal day be like for that person? And he talks about a lot how we just, um, so one thing that's fascinating to me is that 
we have about, I think, 70,000 thoughts a day. And like, I don't know yeah. if it's 70% of those thoughts are thoughts we had the day before. Oh my. So we're constantly living in the past, right? Yeah. And re these repeat it. So he talks about how can we change that? How could we break those patterns and really start, you know, like getting change in our life in the areas mm. that we need? Oof, that's a loaded topic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating. You have me even my, my interest peaked even. And more. it's science backed. It's all about yeah. neuroscience with the brain and what happens in the brain and stuff. So it's really fascinating. Yeah, there is something to be said for positive energy and mindset, but you're right. At the end of the day, if that's all we're told and there's nothing behind that, yeah, it's, right. it's tough to kind of continue to buy in. So I, I love that the, this, the science piece is included. We'll make sure to link to to these resources for everybody listening in and watching in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. And uh, let's just go ahead and jump right into the topic yeah. today, Fuse, because this is a big one and we're going to kind of get into some of the nitty gritty, the details. Before we do this, so I just want to give our, our listeners context because, you know, a lot of times it, it would be easy to bring somebody like yourself on um, talking on a particular topic that's not specifically photography related. And they're like, oh, she's not a photographer. I don't, I can't relate or she doesn't relate. You, you actually have photographic experience in addition to doing this. So I'd love for you to just give a, a very short backstory of how you did photography or are doing photography and then tied that into SEO. Sure. So I was living in New Jersey when I started my photography business 13 years ago. And both my kids were, I had two kids under the age of three. Um, and I was self-taught, really wanted to get out there and stop photographing my cheap Brazilian community in my church. Okay. So I'm like, okay, I photographed everyone here. I think I really need to get out there with American audience. And that was the time when a few blogs, you know, of some very well-known photographers started arising. The, it was like the birth of the blogs. Yeah. So I started reading a lot of information and I really like, I really saw the power of social media. So I wasn't able to physically go to a lot of networking events in the bridal community in New Jersey. But when I did, I would always really follow up and I would I was really good at nurturing the relationship online. So people kept saying, oh, I see you everywhere, but they really were seeing me online. And at the time was Twitter. So I booked a wedding via Twitter, which is crazy to me looking back. So I realized there was something there and I realized that I really liked marketing. I really liked this aspect of, you know, I didn't have any money to market myself. We were very, I wouldn't say broke at the time, but almost, almost there. Sure. And I'm like, okay, what else can I do? So yeah. social media and nurturing relationships online. So I remember I had a saying that if you compliment someone online, they can't ignore you even if they don't like you, right? So if you tag someone, they kind of like feel obligated to repost. But two years into my photography business, a fellow photographer told me about SEO and how mm. he was optimizing his website to be found for a smaller wedding venue. I think it was in San Fran or San Diego. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, there's this thing called SEO. So you can make changes on your site in order to help clients find you in Google. And I was like, what? What do you mean? Like, I feel like I fell in love. I say it was like love at first sight. Okay. But then I ran into a really big problem. It was a very male heavy techie world where the crazy Brazilian mom was definitely not welcome. <laughs> so I started like just, you know, even though I couldn't understand a lot of the things, I even volunteered to photograph one of the biggest SEO conferences at the time. And, you know, I was just thrilled to be there. I had no idea what they were they were saying, but I was just thrilled to be there. So what happened in that is that I started just signing up for everything that I could and then started putting things into practice as I understood okay. with blogging, specifically at the time was blogging um, and, and really focusing on wedding venues to be found by wedding venues. And then I started seeing the results, you know, brides were, I started getting the email, I found you in Google. And that's when I knew there was something there and I became very excited about that. And then what ended up happening was Facebook groups came about and anytime there was a question about SEO, I kind of like knew the answer and I started getting to be known in the photography community mm -hmm. as an SEO expert. And I launched my first boot camp in 2013 before oh, wow. online teaching was a thing yeah. and i had <laughs> yeah like it was on google plus that's before how everybody old. had a course yeah <laughs> every before there was teachable or kajabi or podia it was sure. on google plus sure. so i got 60 signups and i was i just i was like really felt like amazing at being helped being able to help other people that were also not tech savvy like me to get results and to be found by potential clients. So 
I, I really fell more in love with, with the marketing aspects than the actual shooting the weddings. And then a, a couple of life changes happened. I ended up working at a marketing agency for two years. Um, and now I offer photography for my current marketing clients who are really more um, branding photography. Sorry, that was kind of longer, but it, it, but that, that that's context. the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it gives context for our listeners because it, it, actually to our very point, the fact that there are so many courses these days, naturally people yeah. are probably going to be a little bit more apprehensive and be like, okay, so why does this person think they can teach me about this thing? Right, um, yeah. And, and I just like to be able, if I can, to give context to our listeners, those that I have coming on to talk about particular topics, mm -hmm. um, to let them know why. They, they should be paying attention. So that, that's yeah. certainly helpful. I appreciate that. But let's get into the nitty gritty. Yes. And, and what we're going to talk about is not just simply SEO. There, there are a lot of different people teaching on SEO, but more specifically, some of the changes. And you actually mm -hmm. told me before we went live today that there are three, you might be able to frame them as four changes that have, that have happened in the last 18 to 24 months that photographers need to be aware of when mm -hmm. it comes to SEO. Go, let's go ahead and, and just list each of those. And then I want to dig back through each one and, and understand better what each of them mean. Sure. So um, the first one is the role of voice search. OK, so the Alexas and the series are changing the SEO game. How so? Well, when we text, when we type, I mean, um, we type shorter words than when we speak. Right. So for me, I'm old school. I like type with my two fingers my sisters make fun of me so you know i'll be like restaurant near me but when you're using voice you can say usually it will be a longer text um another example is future generations are probably not going to type i mean my sons use voice search for everything they don't really type up things they hmm. send audio they, they do facetime mm -hmm. they send audio notes mm -hmm. and they and they do like the the, the voice search uh, so do you want me to list them or do you want me to ready to go through each yeah, one? Let's, let's actually just list one, at least list all of them and then we'll go back. Okay, and so each, yeah. voice search. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other thing is uh, the power of the, the UX. So UX um, stands for user experience. Um, so before SEO was very um, search engine, Google bot centric, mm. but that has changed. Yeah. Now it's really about the human behind the search mm. and not the search itself. So that, that's that been fascinating to okay. see. Okay. Um, and then the power of local. So local SEO has become more and more significant um, as users are looking for more local things to do. Um, so that th there's just been a rise with that. And I would I'd probably say the fourth is how blogging has changed um, and how I think a lot of photographers think that blogging is dead, but it's not. And but I'll tell you that blogging every session is not a great idea. Ooh, OK, so we'll come back to that. Let's go back. <laughs> so to I'll the leave you with that cliffhanger. Yeah. Cliffhanger, <laughs> leave us and then we'll come back. So back to role of voice search. And it seems like the mm -hmm. thing that you're highlighting here, I think you had actually messaged me about this, too, is that there rather than simple text, um, just very brief text on, for example, mm -hmm. our homepage, that because of voice search, it, it's actually more relevant now to have longer form text. Is that right? Or is that is that oversimplifying it? Yes, it's not oversimplifying, but let's let's get let's get into it a little bit more. Okay. It's conversational text mm. with user intent. So if a user is looking for a photographer for a certain, you know, let's say boudoir photographer. I know you recently did um, an episode with I boudoir photographer. I have to jump in, Fuse. Do you have a dog drinking water in the background? I do. <laughs> for those of you listening to that audio is so only, loud. I'm Fuse so is sorry. not drinking water. That is her pet in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. She's very thirsty. Apparently. She's a rescue dog. Okay, Candy, are we done? Oh, no, no, it's totally okay. fine. I, it just, it's sorry. too funny not to bring That's up. so funny. I'm not even like, I'm so into it. I can't even hear. But yes, <laughs> yes, that that is that is my dog. And hopefully they'll they'll behave. Is she? No, um, no, absolutely, totally fine. It was just funny. Please, please continue. That is funny. <laughs> so conversational text. So one mistake I feel like photographers make is very industry jargon. OK, so one really yeah. quick homework that people can do is mm. do a control find on your pages and see how many times you're using the word session. Mm. And for certain kinds of photography, clients are not using that word at all. Um, so then, you know, we're not adding a variety of things like pictures, portraits, 
Um, and then we're, we're um, doing like the short descriptions like you said. So mm -hmm. instead of calling it, let's talk about your pricing page if you have one. Instead of calling it um, collections, do photo collections, studio collections, mm -hmm. right? So mind you, so that um, so with formatting, that becomes a thing with formatting with your H1s and H2s. So H1 is basically the heading. So usually the bigger text in your header or what you call your page many times is what the H1 is. It really will depend on your theme. Um, certain sites you're able to really easily change what the H1 is without affecting the design. But the H1 was really made to stand out on a page, but it also tells Google, pay attention. This is what this page is about and this is really important. So then if you have a very vague H1 or like you're highlighting a tagline, which might not really stress what the page is about, it can be misleading um, for Google. Um, and then H2s also matter for SEO. And H2s can be like FAQ sections, can be like how you're breaking down a longer form page. Okay. So let's say if you have a header photo, then you have a little bit of text, then you have maybe a photo gallery, then you can have a client testimonial, then an, an H2 that talks about maybe like the, um, the studio session. Um, but again, if I read, well, if I read, a big tip is if you read that word by itself, would you know what it's about? Yeah. Isn't it funny? And I, and I kind of want to bring it back to this because we start talking about H1, H2. I know some people's eyes are kind of glazing over. They're like, okay, I yeah. don't quite understand the technicality of that. And I'm just going to go and throw this out there, Fuse, because um, for our listeners, we're only going to be going to be able to get so far into this conversation yes. today. Get found with Fuse.com. There's, there's plenty of opportunity. And, and Fuse, I'll let you share about this more in detail at the end yeah. of our conversation here. There's plenty of opportunity for those of you listening and watching to reach out to Fuse and learn more about this and get help in her consulting services. Yeah, and DM me if you're like, oh, I don't really know what, what this is. And yeah. Nathan, if you want to pull up your site, maybe I could just show like sure. on the front end one of your sites I could, I could show. It's basically those text headers, right? Absolutely. That are usually bigger on, on the page. Yep. Yeah. And, and I'll do that in just one second, but just for the sake of highlighting this very, very important point, because we and I know you see it all the time. I certainly see it all the time. Photographers are truly using industry jargon all the time on their site all the time, rather than just simply using words that would resonate to the majority of their potential audience and, and like simple words. I think a lot of times we try to be cute and pretty and creative. Oh, yeah. Like and like love notes. What is that? Don't <laughs> exactly. That's the phrase. Just call that's call it reviews. Yeah, it's nobody's it's, looking up. What are the love notes of, you know, Nathan's photography, right? <laughs> so like reviews, testimonials. So we yeah. have to p think like our clients. So for exactly. me, my ideal clients are photographers, so I can do that. Yeah. Um, this is happening a lot with this new genre of photography, which has really boomed in the last year, which is branding photographers. Um, mm. Businesses are not looking up the word branding photographer per se. They're looking up words like business portraits, professional photos for my website, headshots. Oh, right. fuse, but I don't do headshots. But on your back end SEO, you should use that term that you're for you to be found. And then when I get to the page, then you explain to me headshots versus brand photography. What is the difference? It's more lifestyle. It's this. So it's like show and tell because mm -hmm. to them, it's new. The other problem with the word branding photography is that Google can confuse your website for branding services. Hmm. So you're standing in a fine line there where Google can get confused as, oh, does this person offer logos and branding services? Oh. So yes. So that's why more context. So for Google, you're always trying to give them more context. So I give this example many times. What's the difference between, so bass playing and, um, Bass playing and bass fishing. They're spelled the same, right? B-A-S-S, -S, I believe. Context. The fishing is going to have words like ocean, rod, bow, um, bait. The music is going to have notes, um, chords, lessons. So are you giving Google enough context for it to understand what your page is about? And let's say you're a family photographer. If you're a family photographer and you do, let's say you do families, maternities, and newborns. Uh, so what is the page that tells me that you're a maternity photographer? And if that page is just a gallery page with photos, it's not really telling Google anything. Mm. So that's a huge mistake I feel like um, 
photographers make is they have one info page, then mm -hmm. they're listing out all their services, and then they have a few galleries, and then they're confused why they're not showing up in Google results. So it's time to start really separating those pages. So for every main service, you should have a page, or you can turn your current photo gallery into an info page. Um, so let's say, oh, Fuse, I don't want to have three gallery pages plus three info pages. Then see if your theme allows you to add text at least to your maternity gallery page, because then that's a beautiful marriage right there. Um, and you're adding both and you're giving Google the context of what that page is about and, and about that service that you offer. Okay. Another thing for, I feel like on the website that photographers make is not really saying their location enough. Sometimes I have no idea where a photographer is located and I can't guess by looking at your zip code, you know, your area code for your phone number. So you really should say on your homepage where you're based out of, which areas do you serve, do you travel, um, and then kind of repeated that on your about page if possible and even contact page. So that falls into a little bit about the local SEO, which we're gonna talk a little bit more on my other change. But yeah. the conversational, just really one simple, really like hack and tip for whenever you're working on content for a photography service page, go to Google, look up that service or look up that type of photography, then go to the section that says people also ask because then you're gonna see exactly how your potential clients, what mm -hmm. they're looking for online, and mm -hmm. how you should be phrasing it on your website. And answer those questions. I also um, do not believe you should have one main FAQ page if you do different genres of photography. I really think the FAQ should be specific to that genre of photography. So, you know, when is the best time to get my maternity photos done? Um, you know, do you offer a clothing wardrobe for the maternity portraits? Is makeup included in my maternity photo shoot? Um, and that maternity page should have other words like pregnancy, expecting, you know, moms. Like I live in the area known as South Florida. So if I did that, I'd be like South Florida moms and adding that text naturally, but it should be conversational. It shouldn't be robotic. It shouldn't be keyword stuffed either. It should definitely be, you know, and then survey your clients, go through Facebook groups, you could go to sites like Quora. I love Quora.com and Ask.com. Any form, Reddit kind of scares me, so I don't really go in there. I feel <laughs> it, like is, it is kind of a it, deep, dark hole sometimes. Yeah, it's like, I feel like I'm going to get kicked out. I'm going to do something yeah. wrong in there. But, you know, these places where regular folks, you know, potential clients are going to, um, and the way they are asking is really how you should be writing the website copy. So with all of this is we're really saying, we should have more website copy for sure, 100%. And out of all my VIP clients, I've had 13 VIP clients this year, 100% of them have needed new pages. Hmm. So really breaking out those pages yeah. is gonna help increase your rankings you know, a whole lot more and, and make that text conversational. I was already making notes actually to like the, about that very thing. I'm like, oh man, I, we need to, we need to break out some of our pages even more because it is easy yeah. to, to think that like, oh, oh, it's so we need to simplify it, keep it one place, make it easy for them. But for the sake of SE, first of all, navigation, which we're actually getting ready to go to in a second, UX user experience is, is a, an important element of this whole P of this uh, whole equation. But for the sake of SEO, breaking it out into separate pages will enable mm -hmm. us or enable the potential searcher potential client to find us in a more relevant way, correct? Right, and that individual page can be found by itself. And there's actually mm. something brand new that I hadn't even seen, and I found in, in just doing some, looking some things up before our interview, is that now Google, it's called, I forget what it's called, page. So basically, instead of a whole page ranking, Google is doing something, I forget the technical name, where an excerpt can rank by itself. Kind of like mm. in the people also ask, so okay. to me, that's fascinating, right? Yeah. So this is why formatting is really important. I also know that Google loves bullet points and numbered lists um, because it, it, it helps, uh, you know, answer a query or answer a potential question that a user searching on Google may have. Um, so these formatting things are really cool to know that that one page. So, you know, that yeah. maternity page can rank by itself instead of you thinking that it needs to be the whole domain. Does that make sense? 
Well, I think we actually have a question here that maybe set you up not only to, to kind of follow up on what we were talking about, but to move us into this conversation about UX. But Casey on Facebook says, does it matter where or how the text on those pages are laid out? And you were talking about the significance of uh, bullet points or number mm -hmm. of lists. Mm -hmm. Anything that you want to add to the answer to that question? Yeah, oh, great question, by the way. So one thing we don't want to do ever is hide any text. That's Black Hat SEO. I remember a long time ago, somebody was like, ooh, we could we could put um, white font on white background. No, don't, <laughs> don't be doing that. Don't be, I mean, Google's smart, very smart. So wait, um, will Google actually flag that? Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, you'll get in trouble. Don't do that. You could actually get blacklisted um, and that's what happened in the last four years. Google has made a lot of updates because there was just a lot of spamming things. Mm -hmm. So for example, JC Penning almost got blacklisted because they overused the word. It was like sweaters or something. And they bought a bunch of, they had a bunch of backlinks for this one keyword uh, and they almost got in huge trouble because okay. it's, it's spammy stuff. They were playing the system. Uh, yeah. They were playing the system. So this is a great question. So what's important to note about text is Google loves hierarchy and, and Google loves like organization so you definitely want whatever that main keyword idea is you know so let's say uh, let's take Geraldine she's um, an elopement photographer based in Orlando so we actually labeled her 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 page Orlando elopement photographer so guess what because there's people actually that go to Orlando and elope um, which is a lot easier to rank for than destination photographer so she added Orlando elopement photographer as like a header then you kind of want to make sure that that's on your like first paragraph um just naturally and then we want to make sure that at least one of her image seo which is oops sorry something fell but the we're dogs good are, the dogs are playing yeah the dogs it. are playing around <laughs> all text um so we want to make sure that one of those texts is in the image all text um, the rest is just really formatting the page for the user. How is it flowing? So you never really want huge sections of text because of our next point with UX is the mobile experience. Mm. So you want to like, you really like for every 150, 200 words, you want to break it up. Um, so another little tip or hack could be bolding certain phrase or having like a standalone phrase, like a tagline and even changing the font color. Yep. That's really great for blogging. I do that a lot when blogging. Like if I want something to stand out, I'll change the font color and breaking it up. So break it up with images, then a little bit more text. Then if it's a service page, then client testimonial. Um, and lots of times you could also have um, if you if you're working on a bigger FAQ section for let's say I'm gonna just go back to that maternity page you can basically break that up do like a first section and then photos in another section or you could put it if you want it more down which is more for like SEO purposes you can so I hope that answers the question. Uh, you just like the level of practicality in this conversation <laughs> today I'm just loving and, and just real quick you mentioned your blog and you just mentioned bullet points and I'm on this I think the most recent blog post and there's a prime yeah. example of that very thing where you've got bullet points and then social photos. media marketing goals and yeah, certainly yeah. photos, which I'm sure have alt text. And then the, the number yeah. of lists that you talked about. I mean, yeah, this is, uh, this I'm is like really scared of viewing my blog because I just switched <laughs> to back to show it. I'm like, <laughs> is everything sure okay? everything's in, in line. I right? know because I'm always working on my clients. I need to so actually I'm taking December off to work on my own SEO. I'm going to be my own VIP day client. So. We have to, yeah, I think that's smart too. like to take a step back and do that, especially as yeah. to slow down just a little bit. Right. Um, Okay, so I mean, I wish it is super dark here today. It's really cloudy outside, so it looks like I'm in this kind of hole right now, this cave of a situation. <laughs> I think I just your face spotlight. lighting is good. Is it okay? All right, yeah. all right, it'll do for now. All right, so I want to keep going though because we have so much to talk mm -hmm. about still. We're, we want to. I want to transition to UX. Yes. Um, and and obviously these aren't. It's not like just one or the other. These are all interrelated. No, they're in some all way. interlinked. But okay, let's talk so about the significance of UX, especially as the, the the changes you were talking about that are happening right now. The yes. way that Google looks at our site. So I'm going to throw another term at you. Maybe you haven't heard it before, Okay. but it's called CRO. Do you know what this is? No, I don't think so. Okay. CRO, conversion rate optimization. Ooh, okay. So when working with a client, I'm not only working on SEO, but I'm working on the CRO because mm. at the end of the day, I look at SEO this way, Nathan, it's like, let's say I have a store on fifth Avenue in New York. Mm a dream right very expensive uh, but i mean thousands of people 
right? Yeah. Passing by each month. Sure. But if my window display is not enticing for them to come in, mm. or if the thousand people come in but nobody makes the sale, right. what's the point? Right. What's the point of ranking, you know, for a hundred keywords on the page one of Google if people are actually not booking me? So with that, we want to think what is the conversion that I'm expected on my site? So for many photographers, it's the form fill. For some, it might be the phone call. For others, it might be a DM. You know, we are in that world. Um, you know, maybe a chat box. So sure. with that, you have to look at the user experience on how am I making it easy for my client to take the or potential client or user to take the action that I want them to take. So I feel like many times we don't, so I have like this freebie, I'm actually gonna send it to you so people could just download. Right. It's called the user, user map roadmap. So okay. you have to guide your audience, hmm. okay? So let's say, uh, what are my top three pages? Maybe it's my homepage, portfolio investment. How am I guiding them there? Where are the call to action buttons? So I feel like subconsciously for some reason, we create a lot of hurdles to get to the conversion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we don't, you know, like an easy, an easy hack, add your email in the contact form. Not everybody likes contact forms. Add your email there. Make it easy for people to understand where you're located. And ha I think every page needs at least two call to action buttons. And that could be like, go visit this page, learn more about me. And then in the about me page, I'm, I'm gonna make sure like view my portfolio. I am telling them, I am guiding them. Yep. I'm like, you have to hand hold. Yes. Because remember, our potential clients are not gonna know that that little arrow means there's another photo there. Or that that little circle right so we think like creatives we're like this is beautiful it has <laughs> yeah. videos and images yeah. it's fascinating yeah. but if your client doesn't know how to use your website or user i keep saying client but user a visitor doesn't know how to use the website that's a problem so that's going to tell google they're going to leave mm -hmm. and that's going to tell google that you were not a good fit for what they were looking for mm -hmm. and the more often that it happens the the lower Google is going to push you because they're they're going to think you're not trustworthy. Your site, your content, and your site is not trustworthy, and it's not wow. a good match for what these people are looking for. And it makes sense because at the end of the day, Google wants to please its its audience, its clients, right? It wants to find the best perfect match for what these people are looking for. So the user experience means: Do I have? Am I breaking up this text enough? Is it visually appealing? Is it fast? Speed is so important, guys. You have no idea. Like, I'd rather you chop off your whole site almost for the mobile and make it just really simple than have a gazillion pages on mobile. So the other change that, that's happened along with this is that Google has changed from desktop indexing first to mobile indexing first. That means it's showing the mobile reason because a lot more people are on their cell phones, right? And iPads looking up sites and looking up information. Yeah. So when thinking about the user experience, think, am I guiding them to the pages I want them to go? Am I making it easy for them to really take the action, the conversion that I want them to take? Um, there's a stats that I think for every question on your form, you lose 25% or something crazy. Um, so I understand filtering out, you know, clients and, um, that's great, but you know, sometimes less is more, I guess. And um, so those are some things to, to think about when it comes to the user experience. Loading time is a big one. And mm -hmm. is it easy to navigate, you know, and find the pages that they, they potentially could be looking for? Do you recommend uh, Google PageSpeed Insights? Have you used that yourself? Yes, I have. But today, like I was looking at the, my mobile score, it was like, not good. So I have yeah. to work on some. Yeah, you should really in Google search console, it's a little bit more techy, but they also have a new like core web vitals and you should. Mm -hmm. um, so Google Analytics analyzes um, how visitors find your site and how long they stay and what they do there. Google search console analyzes the Google bots, how the search engines um, what they can see. Um, so it's good to have because if there's ever any big issue, then that's where you need to go and see where Google can be flagging something, okay. something could be wrong with, with your website, which is a little bit more techy. But for something like that, you could go on Fiverr and, and hire somebody to check um, and you know do more technical work.
Oh, it's, it's highly, highly valuable. I mean, it, we've had um, the wonderful opportunity to work with well, a number of people. Uh, and that is certainly one of the tools that's come up, especially as it relates to, to engagement with our site. Yes. It's, it's extremely important. But you were talking about page speed uh, or loading speeds mm -hmm. and loading times, especially for mobile. And you're right. Uh, there is the technology that we implement, particularly for mobile, is so important. And for anybody listening who's never gone to just Google, Google page speed insights, that phrase, and, mm -hmm. and jump on that site, type in your website and look. And it's probably going to be staggering, as Fuse just pointed yeah. out at times. And you're looking, you're like, oh, my word, you know, all this red glaring at you and low yeah. numbers. <laughs> but it's it's extremely insightful as well, because it gives mm -hmm. you a really detailed list of things that need to be addressed. And a lot of them may be super technical. You can go to somebody like Fuse or um, a developer or otherwise to help yeah. you with some of that technical stuff and, and get some of that cleared up, because it, it does make a big, big difference. Um, yeah. Go ahead. And for us, it's the image size is usually the, the problem, right? That's a right? Big, like, big part of it. That's Absolutely. a huge one. You really, like for blog posts, for example, mm -hmm. you really shouldn't be using more than 900 pixels wide. Like, you know, like it, it shouldn't be 2000. So right. it really should be web size images. Mm -hmm. um, there's plugins now that can help you also um, I, like compress the image without losing the quality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my blog's been around for so long, it's thousands of photos. So I've had to invest in that. I invested in the short pixel plugin on the WordPress side. Um, so there are tools out there that can help with that. Yeah, there's that's something that we spent quite a bit of time on as well, specifically the, the size of images on our blog yeah. posts and, and our website. It really does make a difference and we're shooting for I mean, in an ideal world most, world, most of our images would be under 100K. I think we're mm -hmm. averaging ourselves um, somewhere in the realm of 150, 180K per, per image as far as the actual um, size of the image, the file size yeah. of the image, because we're looking mm -hmm. at load time. Um, so yeah. you can translate to, to, to pixel size as well. But uh, mm -hmm. nonetheless, super important. I won't stay here because we've got one or two more yeah. points to hit on. So yes. the power, and again, for everybody listening in, this is a loaded topic. We're just kind of scraping off the top. There's so much to, to And I covered. love questions, so keep it coming for and listening yeah, live. There, and yeah, please, for those of you that are that are on board with us right now, don't be shy. Jump in, ask questions. And tell us comment. what you do because I love giving examples of what you guys do. Mm. So if you have a specific Perfect. niche. Well, what I was going to say to you is, is just reemphasizing what I said earlier, which is that you you are an incredible resource and offer services in this realm. So for those of you listening and are like, oh, my goodness, I can't even comprehend everything that you're already telling me, <laughs> reach out to Fuse. And of course, we'll link yes. to her site in our show notes at bocapodcast.com. But uh, third point you mentioned was the power of local. Now, I've noticed this yeah. on just a very simple level in the last six months to a year or so and seeing all the Google Maps results that pop yes. up when you do a search. Now that's at the top. Um, and a very prominent part of the search results, but how else has this been demonstrated? Okay, there's a few ways. So the first thing is Google My Business. Please, if you don't do anything else, if you don't listen to anything else in this whole interview, up your Google My Business game. I'll tell you why. Number one, it's owned by Google. Number two, it's free. Number three, it's super easy to do. Number four, it uh, makes up 25% of local SEO. That's a big chunk right wow. there. Wow. So if you don't do anything on your site, you have to sign up first of all to Google My Business, mm. but lots of uh, you know, lots of us signed up like years ago and kind of just let it and forget it. So <laughs> right. you will, yeah, you're like, "Oh, it's there. I'm signed up." So <laughs> yeah. here's the thing. In the info section, there's an area called services which allows you to add a description. So this is how you optimize your Google My Business. You want to make sure you add description there. You also wanna make sure that you fill out a COVID update because they have this section about COVID updates. So you wanna say, that's under posts. You wanna say if you're open, if it's by appointments only, if you have certain um, requirements like mask or, or, or you know safety, whatever safety mm -hmm. measures you wanna say. Mm -hmm. You also, so you wanna make sure that's, and you also wanna work on getting reviews. That's extremely important. If you have less than five reviews, go get your reviews reply to every review do not worry about a perfect five score i don't trust people that have a perfect five score. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like who's the, writing reviews for you yeah yeah like no one's perfect right um right. don't worry about you know and and issues can happen there are crazy people out there i've had issues where i've had to flag it with google you know flag and wedding wire before like there, there's been the crazies out there so and sometimes there'll be people who are like oh my god when did were you my client? So you could, you always want to be nice. You want to always want to be very professional um, and try to resolve, you know, give us a call. How can we, you know, help? So the other thing with Google My Business is you want to take five minutes a month and add new photos. 
because the photos will help you stand out from your competitors because whenever your listing comes up if you hadn't added new photos in a while it will say photo was added 52 weeks ago so we're, i'm like are you even in business anymore like right. your photos are so old and you're a photographer mm -hmm. yeah, so it's like showing at, up on instagram with no no recent yeah, posts. yeah exactly so and then the other thing which um is a bonus it's called google posts which is kind of like a tweet meets an Instagram post. That's how I like to see it because it expires every seven days oh, okay. and, and it's a little manual. So basically they have a few features in there. So if you sell products, let's say you're running a mini session or you're, or you're having a black Friday deal. Um, then you could put on there that those are the type of posts that will stay on there longer. So basically you can add a photo, you can add actually more than one photo, you can add a link and you can add a description and it shows up really beautifully in Google results. If you ha have a kind of e-commerce shop as well, you can add products. So there's all these like added features that I feel like are underutilized and mm -hmm. probably underutilized by your competitors as well. So that's something you could get ahead of the game. Okay. The other piece of local, I'm going to say two other kind of sub pieces. One, photographers tend to ignore their small towns and be really obsessed with the big town. Um, this mm. happens a lot with people that live Charlotte, Chicago, Atlanta, where, mm. you know, it's a lot of little areas. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that Google knows where people are located when they're searching and the distance you are from that person. So do not be afraid to embrace the little town. Do not be afraid to say I'm located in Franklin Park, Illinois. Interesting. Instead of trying to rank for Chicago, especially if your studio is actually in Franklin Park and not Chicago. Yeah, my so, natural response to that would be, well, but I'm, I know there's not going to be enough business to support my model in Franklin Park. So I'm going to I'm going to set myself up for Chicago. How would you push back against that? Because your potential clients maybe work in Chicago, but do not live in Chicago. Okay. okay. Think of a bride. Yep. They're probably getting married at a wedding venue in Chicago, but they do not live there. Fair. But the answer really is Google understands the geography and those parameters, right? And if you have a physical studio, it's kind of shady if you're trying to rank for Chicago, if your studio is not on there, okay. right? Like yeah. if you have a physical store, right? Yeah. Brick yeah. and mortar. Okay. Um, the other thing about Google My Business is that if you don't have a studio, you could list just services and you could list several zip codes and not and not show your address, right? Your home address, which you're not going to want to 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 do that um, anyway. Um, so there's that. So that's what I'm always like. Embrace the local town. Embrace the local town and, you know, don't ignore it. But you can say serving the greater this right Where, wherever how they call it, the greater area. Sure. Um, that's the thing. And the other thing, there's such power in local link building. Hmm. So uh, you're probably going to remember when trying to get on a wedding blog was a huge ordeal, right? right. Style me pretty green wedding shoes. It was like the yeah. thing. Yep. And that's great. They have really high domain authority, page authority. That's wonderful. But it's much more important getting a link from a local business or mm -hmm. a local site okay. than a big site. Wow. Because it's like a local network you're creating. Okay. And it's like you're vouching for each other locally. Yep. Yep. So, you know, think of how, do, do you ever get involved with any school activities in your town? Um, you know, do you ever sponsor any school activities events? See if you could get a link on the site listed mm. as a sponsor, a link back to, to your business. Okay. Um, see if you can co-host an event. Events do really well in Google and Google My Business. Um, and online, but there's just such a power like, you know, of this local business helping this local business and together you become strong in the eyes of Google. Wow, okay, that's, and again, I appreciate you bringing fresh ideas here because that's yes. not something that I've heard emphasized. Um, okay, one last thing, because I know we have limited time. Yes. And, and we, we could literally spend three hours and, I know. and cover everything. I but, know. <laughs> um, let's, let's go to that last point that you had made that blogging has changed, that first of all, it's yes. not irrelevant, but what is, I guess, how should photographers approach it now in the current environment? 
Sure. So many photographers have given up blogging altogether, which is not the right thing. But the good news is you don't have to blog every session unless okay. there are exceptions. Unless I'm sure that's many been will be relieved, by the way, because yeah. the photographers are like, oh, I'm just not a good writer. I mean, what else can you say about this newborn baby? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so true. here's this high school senior. There's like, you know, like, yeah. Besides weddings, everything else is hard to, to describe. Even the weddings, uh, unless you're going to break their whole backstory yeah, down, it feels yes, like the same thing. Yes, right. Over and over I mean, again. yeah, we're not yeah. Jasmine Starr, the great writer of the you know the backstory. <laughs> Those were always great to read when when oh, when, she's when so she good. did that. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, and she's a writer. You know, like yeah. that's that's her natural gift. Sure. Um, so unless, for example, I've had clients in the past where the blogging was a huge part of their sneak peek and marketing. So unless that's you know, there's that exception. So what's in right now is long form blog posts and i call it evergreen content and curated strategic content hmm. okay um i'm sorry one second because my stepdaughter keeps all right ladies and gentlemen we have a slight pause in the audio here so i'm just going to fill the silence so we don't have dead air broadcast rules uh, I hope you're taking notes. And for those of you that are still chimed in, make sure that you ask questions. We've got just a few minutes here as Fuse comes back and, and joins us. So um, don't be shy. Ask questions as we finish up talking about uh, blogging and, and where we're at right now. Go ahead, Fuse. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't expect us to be here at this no time. And this front door has this old ring, and I'm sure you could ring it when <laughs> she's been coming in and out. So I just let her know. Thank you. You're totally so fine. curated blog posts. So this is what you do. Here are the top five... Um, family portraits of 20 of fall 2021 so instead of featuring one session you're going to feature a couple of photos from several sessions and then you're going to add and answer questions like how did they choose their outfits so these are curated posts like resource posts so let's say if my mm -hmm. ideal audience is a mom mm -hmm. you should definitely have a blog post about top things to do with your kids in your town in the fall okay period okay and that's a lot more fun to write than here's another <laughs> yeah here's another baby in the cute clothes but is, and is it like I, I mean again my initial kind of logical response is what that's how is that related to photography but it is this basically a traffic magnet a lead magnet it's a traffic but a resource your blog okay. should be a resource okay so you want to be like if your ideal audience is a mom why not be known as someone to go to for information Okay. Um, so you're, I have a saying, like if you're a resource, people will remember you, even if they don't need your service right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And you could also add some of your pictures. Like, let's say you've been to that pumpkin patch. You could add some of, and you could say photos by me. Um, so that, that is kind of, you know, one example that, that, that is out there. And I always am like, how can you be a tourist in your own little local town? Right. How can you feature more of the this kind of lifestyle things in your own town, which will help your site get found locally? Number one. OK. Number two is I rather you write one blog post a month that's going to be longer form and featuring more of these things than each session. Let's talk about weddings instead of saying here's another, you know, let's say Ritz Carlton wedding. The blog post should be everything you need to know about getting married. The Ritz Carlton in Miami. Mm like why and then you interview your clients and get them to write it for you why did you pick this venue yeah what was your favorite part about the wedding day so that i'm gonna break it down like the bridal suite the getting ready the ceremony spot the reception and you could add a couple of photos in each you have one nice long blog form answering a bunch of questions that people are looking up and that blog post will bring you tra like traffic every month because it's also what google um, calls a longer tail keyword uh, um, planning a wedding at the Ritz Carlton or getting married mm -hmm. at the Ritz Carlton. You see how long that is instead of like Ritz Carlton wedding. Um, so those types of posts. Oh, fuse. No one reads anymore. Um, that's untrue. People definitely are skimming. That's why the formatting and the bullet points are going to be mm -hmm. very important. Yep. Yes, your content needs to be snackable. People are not going to, you know, we're not back in the day where like we couldn't wait for another blog post by so-and-so. Yes, I agree. That has changed, right? And like even Instagram is becoming like this little mini blog post yeah. um, section, yeah. but you, it's still great for you to be found. It's still great for the person to pin it, to save it as a resource, to come back to um, and read later. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have a personal blog and I'm writing a blog post about traveling to Europe during the pandemic, right? So I have all these different sections like 
you know, about the green pass, um, you know, what to take. Um, so it's resourceful. And I'm thinking of every question somebody might have or things that I've experienced, right? So the green pass was really confusing. Like, do I need a COVID test or not? Was really confusing. So it's being a resource like that and making that blog post a longer form. So January is a great month to do a roundup. Like, mm -hmm. here are my top mini sessions. Mm -hmm. You know, here are my favorite outfits from last family fall portraits. And then, you know, the families chose, and you could ask the families, where did you buy this from? Maybe you could even do some affiliate stuff on Amazon. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and that becomes fun. That becomes way more fun and added part of your workflow. Add, add this post session and post wedding survey where you can mm -hmm. ask some of these questions and get your, your clients writing for you. So at the end of the day, blogging's not dead. It's just, it's change, right? Like yeah. you're going to do yourself a disservice to write a, 300 word blog post about a session. It's not helpful. Well, and, and I do have one question here as we finish up. Casey says, uh, I'm not a fan of writing, so I'm gonna focus on creating videos for a vlog. What is the best way to incorporate vlogging into this method? So maybe that's a two part question. Your thoughts on his perspective on, on doing more vlogging than writing and then the incorporation of that into a blog. So, I mean, I think that's great because YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world, right? So th there's, there's a couple of things that are working really well with that is getting that one vlog and breaking it down because short form video is, is the new thing. And mm -hmm. what I love about short form video is like you can use it in like seven, I don't know. So you can use it Instagram stories, I mean, Instagram reel, TikTok, Pinterest video, mm -hmm. Add it to Facebook, YouTube shorts, Snap. the same video, yep. the same video. There's no like, and, and I love that. And what I think from a vlog, some people will transcribe their vlog and add it to a blog post and make a blog post that way. So that's one option. And also what you can do is, I think the, a great option too is let's say I wrote a blog post, but I have some videos on these topics. I'm gonna embed that blog post, which is gonna help the blog post get found even better because there's gonna be video markup. Google's gonna understand that that blog post has video, so it gives it a different markup. Okay, I, I really appreciate that. And Casey, thanks for chiming in. All you others who are, who are listening in quietly, shame on you. You I need know. to ask more questions. <laughs> but I, no, but in all seriousness, I really appreciate everybody who's listening today, who's joined in the conversation. Casey, for your questions and comments, and ultimately Fuse for for like truly bringing so much practical value. <laughs> I just that that's ultimately what I want this podcast to be. And you've just made it a, a gem of an episode today. Will you, oh, as I mentioned so earlier? Much. Oh no, no, truly, thank you. And because we've only just scratched the surface barely, mm -hmm. will you just kind of brief our listeners on the services that you offer through your brand, Get Found with Fuse? Sure. So right now I've actually turned my monthly retainer services to uh, what's called a VIP day. So the VIP day is basically, you know, for very busy entrepreneurs that know that maybe their back end is a hot mess express. Um, and that they don't have time, right? They don't have time. They have a list of 40 things to do on the website, but they don't have time. So the VIP day is an eight hour intense day where we create these pages. We optimize the back end together and the strategy is done before and it also comes with three check-ins. So a lot of people are loving it. And I, I actually have my first overnight VIP day because the photographer's from Australia next week. So That's it's awesome. going to, yeah. yeah. So it's going to be fun. So it's going to be, I guess, from like 6 p.m. to... I don't know, three in the morning, four in the morning. I'm okay. not sure. So sometimes they'll go nine hours and I've had people actually fly me out to them um, because they wanted it to, for it to be done in person or they could come down here to South Florida. And I also have my Ignite Marketing Club, which basically I've turned all my online courses just to a monthly marketing club. I just think it's easier for people to have access. And if they want a, the class on Pinterest SEO, they can go to that. If they want the blogging class, they could go to that. It just makes things easier. Perfect. And as you were talking here, I've, I've got your website up. Anybody who's listening in uh, or watching who didn't hear it earlier, get found with Fuse, F-U-S-E.com. Yes. We'll link to it in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. 
We, we uh, had a couple more comments here at the end. Casey was saying, thank you for the info. This was great. Chris says, uh, this was a great episode. Thank you for sharing. We had another listener chiming in from uh, the Philippines as well. Apparently. So we've got, we've got listeners nice. all over. Thank you I so much. I love it. Well, and thank you, Fuse, so much for making time for, for all of us today, for sharing so much practical information. We'll put all your information in the show notes at bocapodcast.com get found with fuse.com up there on the screen for everybody watching yes. and then on instagram fuse creative inc we'll link to those yes. in the show notes of Boca Podcast. and remember done is better than perfect now go get found awesome thanks again fuse appreciate it